Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. We are going deep inside with another of the world's greatest arm wrestlers and in typical British Pinar style. I've called her Stevens on Thanksgiving. <laughs> typical blood Brit. Completely forgot about that. Poor bastard. Trying to enjoy Thanksgiving. And suddenly some fat Englishman rings him up and asks him if he wants to do an interview. And he's so polite that he actually agreed to do it. But before we came on, Herman was just getting into a really solid story. I'm going to rewind about two, three minutes. We came on, we were doing the niceties, just having a little bounce round. How are you doing, mate, and so on. And I said, oh, it looks like you're at work. And Herman's like, oh, no, dude, you don't understand. And I said, whoa, 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 sweet child of mine, holdup.co.uk. Tell us all this on the show. So we're going to just go through it. Talk to me about hurricanes, Herman. Yeah, so I'm not at work. Uh, this is my house. <clears throat> um, if you guys don't know, um, around August 26th, 27th, um, Hurricane Laura hit uh, Louisiana. And particularly, it, it was a direct hit on Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is my hometown where I currently live and I grew up. And um, it was the, I guess, worst hurricane in 100 years. It was uh, sustained winds over 150 miles an hour and gusts. Wow. Gust measured literally um, less than a mile from my house at uh, over 195 miles per hour. Um, it literally, uh, like, haircut and topped off all the trees in the area. Um, I think three trees fell onto my house. Um, so I have major structural damage in the roof. Um, I've exposed some walls behind me, and I'm finding some studs broken and all that stuff. And um, funny enough, when I left, um, I said uh, – I have a couple commercial properties in town. I said, you know what? No matter what happens, I'll be able to live in one of my properties. Right. And that was not the case. <laughs> <laughs> so it's totally decimated it. I mean, from, from yeah, I we mean, can't see a great view, but it looks like, have you even got a roof on there, Herman? Um, I do have a roof structure, uh, probably 50% of it's uh, damaged. That's a tarp you see covering the hole in the roof. Um, yesterday I was doing some cleanup work and the tarp was off and I looked up and I said, wow, I'm going to get sunburn working in my own house. <laughs> That's how big the hole is. And, um, and, uh, crazy devastation. I mean, the Google earth images before and after are just ridiculous. I mean, I bought the house. Uh, it's an old ranch house, nothing special, but I bought the house because of the trees. It had all these old trees. My yard looked like a forest in the middle of the city. And if you looked at Google satellite images, you couldn't see my house. Now you can see my house and the grill in the yard. That's, I mean, everything's gone. Oh um, my when I came back, you couldn't walk on grass. There was no lawn because the whole yard was laid down trees. Um, and this devastation is like widespread. This is not, oh, it hit my neighborhood. I mean, it hit Lake Charles and Venton. And How big cities. an area is that for, in, in terms of my the, the major damage was probably over something like 40 miles wide. Um, and I, I, I bet there's some level of minor damage that was like statewide. Like the whole state probably lost power at some point. Um, but Lake Charles in particular had uh, long-term uh, power outages, infrastructure issues, um, et cetera. And uh, in my case, you know, we don't need a GoFundMe or a pity party or anything. Um, I, I do have insurance. Um, really, this is a major inconvenience um, and a stressor. Yeah, Holy yeah, it's, it's more of an inconvenience right. and a stress adder than anything. Um, it's also an opportunity and all that stuff. But uh, there are a lot of people here that um, they have no house left. You know, it's just concrete. Um, they have no job. They have no insurance. They have no skills. And, oh I mean, they're just fucked. So I mean, that's that's a sad situation. It's not really a, a, you know, pity party for Herman Stevens or anything like that. But uh, so if you guys see any – uh, donation centers or things on, on the internet, you know, feel free to contribute because uh, it's it's pretty bad down here. And the the I mean, showing the 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 magnitude of the issue with the COVID pandemic that that wasn't all over the news over here. Um, yeah, yeah, and a lot of people I mean, just didn't know about it, didn't know about it, didn't hear about it, and there are a lot of people here that are pretty, you know, uh, sad that their story wasn't even out. You know what I mean? Like no one cared or the media didn't care to put it out there. Um, and then to top it off, so I think six weeks later, this was mid October, hurricane Delta came and was a direct hit on Lake Charles also. 
Um, oh the winds God. weren't as high, but the rains were worse. So there were people that kind of made it through Laura who then got flooded in Delta. Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is crazy. It's, it's absolutely I mean, crazy. How often in your life, I mean, these, are you in an area where, I mean, we, we here in the UK about you'll have areas in the deep south where there'll be tornadoes, twisters, whatever, you know, I don't know what you'd call them locally, but we call them tornadoes. But there's an area where there are, you have a hell of a chance, you know, of, of, of I mean, yeah, so, this kind of thing. so we are not in tornado. We're, we are not in tornado alley where you get these tornadoes that'll come down and rip up this neighborhood or rip up a single house. Um, we get hurricanes and that's anywhere from like Corpus Christi or Gulf of Mexico, Texas to yeah. Florida. We are all susceptible to hurricanes. We get them every year. Um, some years are worse than others in terms of intensity. Some years are worse than others in terms of number. This has probably been the craziest year in a very long time in terms of both intensity and number of hurricanes. And, um, yeah. And then so when the hurricanes come, you know, you might have this like 50 mile, 50 mile wide hurricane or 100 mile wide storm, and then it will spin off tornadoes. So when we do get tornadoes, it's usually uh, associated with hurricanes and stuff like that. But right? you didn't have enough issues. I mean, that's ridiculous. And yeah. what would, when you say, you know, we have a number of these, or you'll get them, you'll experience this annually. And you talked about the level of intensity. A moment ago, you were saying 195 miles per hour wind. I mean, that is, I mean, I think, I don't think, I don't know what the highest recorded winds are over here, probably over 100, but I know that I've been out in 50, 60 mile an hour winds and you can already lean on the wind. And I'm like a 105 kilo man and I can lean on the wind at 50 miles an hour. So God only knows what 195 mile per hour. I mean, that must be moving trucks. Christ knows what. That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it, I mean, if it doesn't knock your house down or knock buildings down, I mean, things are sliding. Like you could have a big, heavy truck. And it's literally sliding. And it would literally, Jesus. Yeah. How many? What? I mean, how many people were killed? Something like that. It must have been. Um, a, a I don't hit know. I want to say. I want to say it was less than ten. But I mean, that's oh, kind that's, of cute. You, you have all. The, you have all the people from stress that die later mm-hmm. on that you never know. Um, you know, my grandfather. He had COVID. He was in a nursing home. He had COVID in like March, April, May. I didn't think he would survive it. He survived that. And then when the hurricanes came, they moved him. They took him out of the nursing home and brought him to one six hours away, right? We all had to come back to work on houses and stuff. So he wasn't, he had no family interaction. And um, they finally moved him back um, a while ago. And then like, mm-hmm. we would visit, and then the next day he passed. So he was able to oh, return oh, fine. But, but you, you know, understand, like, that won't be recorded as a hurricane death. But, I mean, that moving and then the, the back and forth and all that stuff, that's all related, you know. Dude, I'm so sorry, man. Yeah. No, I mean, it happens. I mean, I, that, that was expected. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pragmatic in that sense. But, uh, um, yeah, this, and like I said, there are people with far worse stories. You know what I mean? It's been a kind of weird year all year. I mean, I didn't lose. Oh, check this out, Neil. So the, the cool thing about the, I guess, the hurricane is that I, we went to Austin, right? We evacuated. So we didn't stay here for that. Um, Greg Gray, I got to thank Greg Gray. He let me stay in his trailer in his backyard, you know, for, I think I was there a couple of days. My wife stayed probably for over a week. And um, on the way back home, I'm getting phone calls saying, uh, what's the smoke coming from your facility? Right. I work at a small chemical plant. And I said, well, I don't know. I'm on my way back. I haven't heard anything, you know, from the company. And um, so, yeah, my, my work was up in flames as I'm coming back from the hurricane. So, <laughs> so if I could check box. Everything that could go wrong. Um, yeah, it's been a rough year. And so we start, we got back. They put the fires out. Um, the place isn't going to run for another year and a half. Um, I still do have my job. Um, uh, but we, we had to let go of about a hundred out of 120 people. So. Oh yeah. my God, Herman. This yeah. is ridiculous, mate. Yeah, pretty interesting. What a. Oh, mate, I feel so bad about your dad. I'm so sorry. Yeah, my grandfather. Uh, grandfather. Your grandfather. That, I mean, mate, bloody awful. Genuinely, genuinely sorry. Um, and we'll move, we'll move on from that. I know it must be bloody awful, but, uh, I don't think anybody 
in the UK has got much idea of what's gone on over there. I mean, all around the world, you're hearing these stories of enormous loss, and uh, I don't think there's ever been a year in living memory like this. It's absolutely bananas, you know. That's but crazy. The, the, as I say, the magnitude of this thing globally just... It, it, this illustrates it, doesn't it? The fact that something like that, where you've had the biggest hurricane in a hundred years and it's utterly decimated a community, ordinarily we'd be hearing about this, and it's gone relatively unreported, uh, such as the, the scope of COVID. So we haven't even introduced this guy properly. So just for, for those of you who don't know Herman Stevens, let me give you a little bit of a wind back and a, and a <clears throat> bit of information about this guy. Herman is... There are certain arm wrestlers that fly underneath the radar. And unless you are in the community of arm wrestling itself, you may not be familiar with Herman. But if you are part of the fabric of arm wrestling, if you understand the sport of arm wrestling and are within realms of arm wrestling at any kind of serious level, you will know this name and you also know that he's the type of arm wrestler that Whoever's in the building that day doffs the cap. Translated, bad motherfucker. End of. I've been trying to get this guy in the World Arm Wrestling League, as he knows, for quite a few years now, and for reasons that we probably we may or may not discuss. That hasn't come about as yet. But Herman is one of those guys who is a perennial threat to anyone in or around his weight class. Tried, tested, proven. And as I say, any of the usual suspects will attest to that without a moment's hesitation. So it's great to have Herman on the show. I want to really understand and let everybody else get a bit of a window on this guy and understand a little bit more about one of North America's very best middleweight stroke-like heavyweight arm wrestlers. And mate, welcome to the show. It's absolutely great to have you on here. Um, I'm just sorry it's in such a a terrible time for you, mate, but uh, you must have a, a lot of stuff whirling around in your in your mind right now. Oh, yeah, busy times, uh, but I'm glad to be here. And like I said, this, and this is how I would come on the show. It would ne- especially yeah. in these times, it, would, it wouldn't be, uh, hey, are you are you free in two weeks? No, probably not. I'm, I'm going to be busy the next two years mm-hmm. fixing this shit, you know, but hey, are you are you free right now? Yeah, I'm free. Let's get it done. So, mate, let, let's let's go back a little bit. We've got so many people on this show, and they've all got different stories. And one of the things that usually is sort of a vein of commonality that runs across these people is that they were the guy that when they were a child, when they were a young man, teenager, whatever it may be, that they had natural prowess in the sport of arm wrestling or another athletic discipline or strength-related field. Then you've got those two or three others who, who weren't that guy at all. And they may have been unique, most notably, potentially, is Engin Terzi, who says that he was on the very weekend of that spectrum, and he got to where he got to by obsession and endeavour. I'm really keen to know, right, particularly with you, Herman, because you seem to be the guy that is a little bit distracted. This is something we've spoken about before, and I've talked about you on other shows with other people, and I've always said, I'm not sure you've ever seen a focused on point Herman. I think you see a Herman who's doing other shit, drifts in, whips a lot of people, and goes and does some other shit. That's the kind of stuff that I really put towards you. You've never seemed to be 100% focused on it because of other things that are going on. Were you the guy that had it there already? Are you that guy, Herman? Do you have that natural strength? Just walk me through the sort of early times when you were a kid, mate, and how this came about. Yeah, um... I don't know. I don't know if I was ever that, I guess, great at athletics in general. You know, I guess earliest memories. Um, my dad's a cowboy. I don't know if you guys know. He's a calf roper. Actually, he was a great basketball player and all this stuff. So my dad's a kind of a freak athlete. Like, I am not <clears throat> the athlete my dad was or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we were doing measurements yesterday, a couple of days ago at his house. He's probably 5'8", three wingspan. Um, his hands are probably about that much bigger than mine, and he's probably about a he's about 180 pounds. Um, but you know, people told me the stories of him playing basketball. He probably could have been a pro. It would have been tough due to his height, but he had the goods to do it. Um, but he was vertically dunking a basketball at five foot eight, you know, with two hands oh. under the goal and all that stuff. So, um, and I think he was also a cross country athlete. So talk about like across the spectrum. 
And, yeah. um, oh, no. and we still play basketball today. He's 53. So I can see what everyone was talking about, you know, even at his uh, old age. So I got some of that from there. <clears throat> and um, mm-hmm. earliest memories as a kid, um, I don't remember being particularly fast. Um, I remember watching like World's Strongest Men and all that stuff like that. And I remember, man, these guys eat a lot of food. You know what I mean? Always drinking this fucking milk and all that shit. And, uh, you know, I remember like overeating, you know, early on. And my dad's like, dude, you got to stop eating all this shit. And I mean, I remember saying like, I wanted to be strong. Like that's what those guys do. You know, eventually I became a fat kid or whatever. And, uh, I can't blame it on the world's strongest men. We just eat down here. That's what we do. Like we, we eat, you know, you're sick. You, oh, it's cause you're, you're not, you're hungry. So you eat and then they say, oh, well, you're tired. Um, you need to eat, but you're tired because you just ate too much, you know, and then it's like a never ending loop. And old people just feed you down here. Um, but yeah, I was always like chubby kid and, uh, always like the strongest in the class, in class mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, always around animals. So when, when you're roping a calf, you know, my dad's on a horse. He's got a rope. He has to rope the calf. Someone yeah. has to wrangle the calves up, run them up a chute that they don't want to be in. You know, release the gate, and someone has to go literally untie that calf when you're done. Um, that was me at, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. You know, oh. and these calves are on the light side, they're 150 pounds when you're not 150 pounds. And, you know, sometimes my dad, uh, I guess a little overzealous, might have been roping a 300 pound calf, right? And that didn't really change my duties. <laughs> the, the calf yeah. still has to go in the chute. You still have to untie the calves and stuff like that, you know? And, um, so yeah, we just, we just always did stuff, you know, handling animals, handling bags of feed, bales of hay, yeah. uh, actual just work, like stuff with your hands. Country strong, farm boy strong. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, one particular story, I remember being in a uh, chute with the calf. So it's only about, you know, yay wide. And so you just push it down the chute. Big calf, stubborn calf. I said, dad, I can't. I can't get the calf in the chute, you know, and my dad, like he hated the word can't like that. Just it just it aggravated him. I said, can you please hit the calf with the hot shot? You know, it's the electric prod. Mm-hmm. And my dad gets the hot shot and he shoots me with the hot shot, <laughs> you know. And so, of course, I, I, I took this calf and I rammed him like 20 feet up and slammed his head into the chute, you know, into the into the metal gates. Um. So, yeah, I mean, that was kind of the uh, the typical stuff, hard work, digging holes, you know, animals die, mm-hmm. you got to bury them, um, putting up fencing and all that stuff. And early sports, you know, dad was a basketball guy also. So, you know, we did a lot of um, basketball drills, fine, fine touch coordination stuff. Okay. Uh, my dad's pretty ambidextrous, so we were always doing stuff right-handed and left-handed. Um, it was always a competition. Oh, can you do this? Well, can you do it left hand? You know, and so um, even when you're working hard, it was uh, OK. So I can I can weed eat. You know, you know, what a weed eater is right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Weed. OK, so I can weed eat this ditch one hand, you know, so I don't fall in, which is kind of heavy as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I would say, well, can I do it left handed? You know, and so I think over time, you know, you kind of develop some level of ambidextrous ability. Mm-hmm. And I think it's why I'm pretty coordinated either hand. You know, I don't, yeah. I'm not very clunky. It's not like, oh, well, his right's got good technique. Well, I'm, I'm kind of balanced. I can kind of do anything on either hand. And uh, it's amazing that, like you say, that you know, that great thing that your dad was so conscious of that, uh, you know, of that, of having that balance in you. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. It's really good to hear. Uh, yeah. with him, it, Probably, like you say, so conscious of it because he was such a well-rounded athlete. Was he into, was he, obviously you've talked about his natural athleticism. Was he also a a very strong person? Was he a strong man? Yeah, incredibly strong, but he never did uh, string sports. He never lifted weights or any of that other stuff. Um, And again, when you're roping a calf, you rope the thing, you jump off the horse, and you have to flank the calf. It's literally like an Olympic clean, you know, or some type of a snatch motion. Yeah. So... He does like a, you know, a, a sprint and he does a clean. And this is what he did all the time. So, you know, you actually become a very strong person doing this. Um, I've been on the basketball court with him or watching and I've seen guys, you ever see a guy get undercut and they flip? Yes. Yep. You know, yep. you're going to hit their head on the ground. I've watched him catch people his size, you know, like yeah, handle his back, hand on his chest mm-hmm. and gently lay the person down. 
Um, so yeah, he's a strong guy, although he never like focused on strength. He was never mm-hmm. one to, uh, like show it off. Like he's not going to lift something just to do it. Um, yeah. I would do something like that because I'm, I kind of like, I really like that stuff, but, yeah. um, very strong. He was always practicality from you, from your dad's perspective. It was done for a, for a purpose and nothing else. So what about yeah. sort of, uh, siblings, mate? You got any brothers or sisters? Anybody, uh, that you sort of compete with at an early age in that respect? I have a, uh, I have a sister who's like nine years younger, so no, not really there. Yeah, and then my brother, my brother, uh, was two years younger. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if we competed a lot strength wise. I was just, cause I was just, I was just a strong guy, period. And I was always like heavier. Um, but we played a lot of basketball, you know, probably near to fighting and all this stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah. And so, oh, hey, hey, Herman. Hey, hey. this is, uh, Herman the third. Say hi. Hey, mate. Hello. You want some crackers? All right, go see mom. <laughs> Jenny, right He's now? not unbelievably cute, is he? Um, <laughs> what's that? He's not unbelievably cute, is he? What a good, yeah. what an hombre. Um, <laughs> but my, my brother Brandon, um, like just sick athlete. So he's probably, Neil, if you, if you want to make an arm wrestler or like start someone from scratch, he's one of those people. He's probably 6'1. Uh, 180 pounds, not a lick of fat on him, bigger bigger hands than I have, you know, probably can do one on pull-ups just because. You have know, you ever but, had, him, had him sort of near the table, mate? Has he showed any interest at all? Yeah, when, when I was in college and just starting, he'd come over and arm wrestle every once in a while. But uh, after college, I was 2,000 miles away. Um, he's closer now. He's about two and a half hours away. But, uh, um, no, he's focused on other stuff. Yeah, doing other things. How yeah. old are you now, Herman? 31. Jesus. Yeah, it, it rang true a minute ago when you said, your dad's not much older than me. It's like, when yeah, you, you yeah, say, yeah. Oh, dad's 54 years. I'm like, fuck me. And I was like, suddenly feel old all, all of a sudden, you know. Yeah. Being Todd Zillis out there thinking, well, oh, okay, yeah, what and, happened? So if, if, if I didn't know who my dad was, <clears> like, I'd, I'd have to hypothesize that I'm like like Todd's mixed son he had on the side or something, <laughs> like back in, his, back in his heyday, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, he's a, did he have a heyday? I think he's heyday now, isn't it, mate? It's, Maybe so. He so. Seems, to be, seems to be getting stronger every year. This time. And, and this is a guy, obviously, you know, we'll get onto that in later episodes, but you've uh, you've done a bit with Todd as well. You've pulled Todd both arms, haven't you? I think, didn't you have a super match one day, both right and left? I yeah, we did. Really cool yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get into it. We'll get we into will, it. mate. We will. So, so, so yeah, me, dad's strong, I brother's it. strong. I was always strong. You know, I wasn't one to lose in arm wrestling to just about anybody, and that was through was middle school. Was arm wrestling the first thing, though, Herman? Or were you, you talked about you're into your world's strongest man and things like that. Did you go? Did you do any other gym training or any other strength discipline at all so, early on? So I guess going into fifth grade, sixth grade, I did play basketball. I wasn't pretty, pretty, I wasn't really good. I was short and I was overweight. Um, very technically competent. Go mm-hmm. as a basketball player, um, and a- academically straight A student. You know, read a lot of books and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> approaching seventh grade, I-, I went to a small school. They said, "Well, we're going to start a football program, right?" Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't want to join. I had too many obligations, taking care of animals at home, school, yeah. and all that stuff. And you know, the coach approached me because I think I got into a couple fights, and they said, "Herman, you get to hurt people legally." And I said, sign me up. I'm um, in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was an offensive lineman or whatever. Again, really strong. Not the Definitely not the biggest guy. Um, I was kind of just short, small, and fat all at the same time. And um, after that, you segue into high school. I did start some weightlifting at that point. Yeah. And um, probably nothing too serious. I mean, college, I mean, high school weightlifting programs are like bonehead plans, you know, the coaches aren't elite trainers or anything, right? So I think, you know, at some point in high school, I probably, you know, squatted over 405. I might have approached a 300-pound bench press. Um, I think I deadlifted once in high school, and I think I did 425. Yeah. And I think the, the real key there was hand strength um, developed, you know, at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was probably about 180, 185 pounds at the time. So Okay. Not like especially strong because I didn't compete in powerlifting. I wasn't trained to be a powerlifter, but definitely not a weak guy at the same time. 
And, um, and at that time, were you sort of gravitating more towards strength sport generally? Is that was that becoming? I think a lot of people in the sort of mid teens, you tend to you get an idea of your are you going to be on the athletics track? Are you going to be a soccer player, a football player? Are you going to do something that's more physical, more of a strength sport or combat sport environment? Did you already sort of have that feeling that okay, this is my niche, this is where I'm I'm going to end up? Well, I, I played football throughout high school. And to me, that was going to be the extent of it. I was probably going to do some weightlifting after high school for fun. Mm-hmm. But I never thought about competing, for, like, seriously in anything. I mean, I wasn't a football player. You know, I was uh, I was a, a straight-A student genius type more than anything, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, I was in every club. I was class president, you know, straight-A's, uh, physics state champion, all-state academic, all that stuff like that. So I was more that than anything. Um, but, um, you know, around the same time, you know, you, you go to go to a little nightclub or something or you, you hang out with the guys. They want to arm wrestle. So, you know, did a little bit of that stuff. I don't recall losing. You know, I did yeah. have one friend who was probably, you know, 6'4", 225 in high school. Um, generally, we were equally strong. From a weightlifting standpoint, I don't yeah, think he really had my type of form strength or hand strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was, he's also as smart too. So kind of a unique, yeah. uh, unique guy. So he would go look up how to top roll people. Right? <laughs> okay. And so we would pull and he's literally like top rolling, you know, he's watching the Magnus Samuelson videos and mm-hmm. he's trying to crank on my wrist and all that stuff like that. And so if someone beat me, it was that guy, but I think usually I was the one winning all of those matches. Um, and then, you know, early college comes, you go to a few bars, big guys. I didn't lose. You know what I mean? Um, I had the yeah. hand screen and I had, like, side pressure. Um, so that not much Were you wrestling, conscious of arm wrestling then? Were you sort no. of like, you spoke about your mate doing a little bit of research and finding the old Magnus Samuelson video, which is interesting. No, I mean, I was, I was just another meathead from an arm wrestling standpoint. Like, my friend was doing the research. I didn't care. Yeah. I'm just stronger. You know, and so um, I guess um, I go to college, you know, full time student, working full time, not really exercising, you know, gain some weight, just not focused on stuff. So that's probably 2007, 2008, 2009. I get back in the gym. So I'm around 205 at the time. And um, 2010 comes around. I'm bored out of my mind. Um, I've, I've taken enough hours early that I have a really light schedule going forward. Um, I saved up enough money. I didn't have to work during semesters anymore. So for someone who's a natural, like, overachiever, push the limits, to get everything scaled down was just m- miserable. Like, I didn't even, I didn't know what to do. Um, and I'm Googling hobbies. That's how bad it was. Hobbies, you know, <laughs> things to do, you know, and, um, I went to the gym one day at LSU, so I'm 20 years old. This is March 2010, and uh, there's a, a janitor watching. And I said, hey, man, how about you come shoot some ball with us? You know, joking. I know he's on the clock. Yeah, yeah. He goes, I can't do that anymore. My shoulder is fucked up, right? I said, how'd you fuck your shoulder up? He said, arm wrestling. And uh, we talked a little bit about it, nothing nothing crazy. And uh, But he did mention that there were real real – competitions and he was serious. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if he mentioned it at the time, but I think he's got a, he had a silver at WAF worlds in like the really? 121s or 132s or something. And a uh, real nice guy. So, you know, I went home and, you know, that kind of arm wrestling was kind of stuck in my mind. So you start, you know, Googling stuff, YouTube and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I found a guy named Joey Fitz. He was a local Louisiana guy. Yep. And, uh, that's how it got started. And, uh, that guy who worked at LSU was, uh, Jason Vincent. I don't know if you remember the Jason name, but. Jason Vincent. I yeah. do remember the name. I know the yeah. name. I don't think I've ever met Jason though. Yeah, but he was, as far as I know, he was really good. And I don't, and this is not to fluff the guy up or anything. No, Other no. people corroborated. I'm really sure he's definitely a podium at WAF in a really lightweight class. Yeah. And, uh, that's how I got into arm wrestling. Oh, God damn, sliding doors. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Single comment like that, and it leads you down that path, and here we are today. So, 
you, you, you mentioned you met this guy, Joey Fitz. When you showed up at the club, was it same, same suit warmed over? You, were you straight into the groove? Did you find you had the natural technique? Yeah, so Joey, Joey, you know, I don't know. Yeah, Joey's probably an amateur at the time, maybe low-level pro. I don't know exactly how long he had been pulling, but he knew how to top roll. He knew how to hook. And he also knew that he was going to cream me, right? Because, you know, hmm. every, everyone comes into the sport, they get their ass beat, and they can't wait until they cross the threshold. So that they can be yeah. everybody else that's new, right? Because you want your turn yeah. to beat some ass. And um, again, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I might be five nine, five ten, and I was probably two hundred pounds at the time. Joey was five ten, but Joey's probably one fifty five, one sixty. Mm-hmm. Um, so still a small guy. And so he gets up to the table, and you know, after the fact, I could tell like how smug he was, and like he just knew what was going to happen. You know, and Joey goes, all right, well, I'm just going to give you a little bit. And he goes, boom. <laughs> and nothing fucking moves. <laughs> my, hand my hand doesn't move. My arm doesn't move. I mean, I don't even give, you know, sideways, you know. And uh, <laughs> so he goes again. Boom. Nothing moves. <sighs> and now he's, like, cocking back. He's all, like, trying to shoot into it like Travis, and nothing's moving. And uh, you can just see his face sliding up, you know. And, uh, you can tell he just, he's like, I've got a ringer. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, at the time, and even still, Louisiana is like the highest drama <laughs> or wrestling state. <laughs> and, Surprised uh, you didn't throw the Louisiana hop on your ass right then. He should have thought yeah, yeah. They did this to me. I wasn't this way before. <laughs> um, this is all in the Baton Rouge area, the state capital. Oh, and so okay. I walk into this. I walk into this with Joey Fitz. And I think there are three or four teams in the same city. Like there's four guys here and two guys here, and two guys here. And these guys don't like, I mean, it was just chaos. I came and, over to uh, Baton Rouge. I pulled, pulled in Baton Rouge a lot when I was younger. I used to come over a train with a guy called Robert Redden. He was a very oh, good yeah, friend. So I'm like, I've never mm-hmm. met the guy, but I heard Dude. he was a beast. I heard he was like a, a bully of a coach too. Like he would just grind you. We, we, we used to just, Go at it hard. When yeah, I go over yeah. there, we used to just pull. And Robert was a really, really good, great arm wrestler. Had all the had all the weapons in the world. Uh, he was training a young Craig too. Uh, so I ended up that uh, very familiar with Craig. We got good friends. Pulled with Craig a great deal. And a number of the guys over there, you know, uh, all the usual suspects who were coming out of the, that area now. The sort of died in the wool, hard nosed pros. Those were the guys that I was put. And Cobra was out there. I said it. Yep. Cobra was actually out there for a period of time. He's working over there. Um, super young Mike Fontenot, before he had his accident, he fell out of the... In fact, oh. I was th- I was actually at Robert Redden's house the day that happened to Mike Fontenot when he was in the, the man basket and it, it collapsed. I didn't know he knew about that. I, I never was there, I was that story. Yeah, Mike Fontenot was in a, in a, in a man basket. And the bloody thing collapsed and he dro- him and another guy were actually roped onto it. Fucking thing fell. And he was really, in, he was seriously injured. Wow. I was actually at Robert's house when that happened. We were over there pulling, and uh, Laurie Redden, his missus, came out and said, oh, shit, this has gone down. You know, we, we were all, like, in shock. But, yeah, I used to get over there quite a bit to Baton Rouge and pull with those guys. Uh, came over, did tournaments over there, really good times. Enjoyed it, fantastic. So you were, I know at that time you'd have been, I mean, what was date check? What kind of time scale are we looking at then? That was, what, 2010, you were saying? Yeah, this is March 2010. Yeah, so I'm way, way earlier. I'm probably 96 to 96 to 99, somewhere around there. Gosh. That kind of time scale. I was going over with Robert. But yeah, it's a hell of a place to be, mate. A lot of good arm wrestlers over there. But I bet, yeah, I bet yeah. you it was like, it was a college Yashil effect, wasn't it? I tried to hit you and your you know, hand didn't move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, and because of the, the, the turmoil and the drama between the clubs, Joey's sitting there going, like, I've got the ringer. Like, this is the guy. My, <laughs> Dude, yeah. yeah, my club's going to trump everybody once this guy learns what he needs to do, you know. <laughs> um, so Joey's a great guy. He got me started. Um, eventually, I mean, I had to find another group of guys that were just stronger. So I ended up at Ryan Tim's house. Again, another club within the yep. five-mile radius. Um Learned some stuff there, you know, could handle most people there, um, except maybe Ryan. Ryan was training at the time, and Ryan had this, like, 
he had that like nasty dummy grip, you know, that oh, loose. Okay. Yeah, uh, loose yeah. Grip. And I mean, that was crazy. I was just like, what the fuck? Because Ryan, I mean, Ryan's not in shape. You know, Ryan doesn't even look remotely like an athlete. And I was like, how is this guy beating me? You know, um, but looking back, great, great experience because, I mean, I just ran through the whole, the whole South. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, that one off. Oh, I'm wrestling piece of piss. <laughs> yeah. Dumb. Yeah. Using, using what, what Ryan, uh, you know, kind of taught me back then, you know, um, and then, you know, so I go to a state tournament and, um, I'm strong, but you know, like I'm still new, right? I'm, I wasn't, I had a strong hand, but I wasn't like a powerhouse. You know, I'm not Rob Bidget. That's for sure. I, I have very weak bicep, you know, cause my focus personally, not competition wise was getting strong and powerlifting, yeah. you know, and so you don't really do curls. You know, I'm a deadlift a lot. I'm a squat a lot. I'm a bench a lot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my hands are strong, but I didn't have a bicep. So, <clears throat> and I definitely didn't know what I was doing. So I would lose to Ray Hendricks and John Toops and some of these guys. Um, and I realized, I was like, man, I'm getting top rolled mm-hmm. by everybody. That's the only way I'm losing, right? Not that I would win in a hook, but that's how people were beating me. And, people, yep. and I wasn't getting top rolled at, let's say, Ryan's practice, you know? So I said, I probably need to go train with Ray Hendricks and those guys, right? Yeah. And, uh, and Ray had even pulled me off the side. He said, Hey, you need to, you need to come train with us. And, um, I was a little hesitant because the club kind of had a, um, bully reputation. You know, I'd heard oh, about, okay. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. And I'd heard about them like getting a new guy, you know, coaching post, 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 and then instantly letting go the guy punching himself in the face and knocking himself out and it being a big joke. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't operate that way. So, you know, Eventually I went and I said, look, here's how it's going to go. I'm not doing, I'm not playing these kind of games. And, um, I think I ended up training with Ray for maybe a year and a half. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was a good experience, but it was still definitely, um, that slaughterhouse type approach, you know, that you would have experienced when Robert yes. Redden was there. and, you know, you know, when you start asking questions, you know, they say, well, look, this is how Robert did it, mm-hmm. you know, and or if, or if yeah. you think this is bad, you should see what Robert did to us. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, so like, you know, Ray would just sit there and Ray would top roll me, you know, like 50, 60, 70 times over and over and over and over again. And um, there was some instruction, but you know how it is. Not everyone is great at teaching. Yeah. You know, and I think what made what Ray was probably good at teaching in a way of he's going to show you what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Right. And he's going to show you what it looks like 50, 60, 70, 80 times, you know, but can't so, articulate it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you like double cap at me and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, bam, that's my practice every week. Just just getting slammed. And before you know it, you know, you start stopping them low, mm-hmm. start stopping them a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Before you know it, you know, you can kind of stick them dead center of the table. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to win. But that was sort of my progression. Yeah. That- Progression, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, there were other guys. There were other guys there, like Brandon Bodwin. You know, Brandon would grab your hand. And he's shoot, see me? Yeah, I, no, Brandon would grab my hand, and I mean, you can't see, you can't see any of your hand, and you can't see your wrist. And I mean, that was just crazy, you know. So that was, I would go home to my friends and just talk about all these freaks. Brandon's what, four hundred pounds or something? Three fifty, massive guy, isn't he? I think at his peak, he or like when he was good, like healthy. Healthy. He was 400 pounds. Yeah, he's a monster. What the hell happened to him? Does he still pull? <clears throat> well, his peak would have been given Michael Hell at Louisiana State in maybe 2011, I think, and then beating Devin Larratt at WAL Vegas in 2014. He, he flopped the shit out of Devin. And then um, he had some infections and some, some staff issues, I think, and like a stomach, a cut that was on his stomach. So then if you're trying to arm wrestle, that never heals up right. And um, I think he just lost the energy. You know, you get a little older. I think he's got five-plus kids and all that stuff. I, I think he started a little bit late also. You know, if that guy had started when he was 20, we'd be having a different story. But uh, yeah. he's still around. He's probably um, an hour away from here. 
Um, he's coaching a couple younger guys or whatever. So he's still around it. So obviously at this time, mate, you're, you're relatively dominant in terms of people who are at a comparable level of experience and size. When was your sort of breakout year? When was the, the year when you moved into that next gear and got into the, the upper echelon of the pros? Well, well, so let me start at the beginning. So I started in March 2010. In March 2010, I went to a local tournament. Um, I got first left amateurs 200 pounds, first right amateurs 200 pounds, first left open 200 pounds. And really? may, I don't know if I placed right-handed, but – um, maybe I got second. I don't know, but I pulled a guy named Jerry Avance. Yeah, yeah, no Jerry Avance. Yeah, right. And when I grabbed this guy, I said, "Oh my God!" It felt like a statue. You know what I mean? So again, in that time, this is before I pulled with Ray and those guys, but I've been pulling Ryan and Joey. These guys are amateurs to low level pros, right? Yeah. So grabbing Jerry was the first time I felt like a national level guy. Yeah. And I said, there's no way I'm ever going to beat this guy. You know, like it just seemed like it was a different, different hemisphere of strength. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm competitive. So I, you know, I just, he just kind of like lays me down. I get off the table and Ryan Tim says, uh, dude, don't feel bad about that. There's no one in here <laughs> that can do anything with that guy. And, J- and Jerry's a freak, you know? So, uh, that was what, the second turn. Jerry in Game of Arms or am I making that up? Jerry, Jerry was in Game of Arms for a very short period of time, and then due to some personal stuff, he just couldn't be on Game of Arms anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Solid dude. Yeah. And so I pulled another tournament a month later, I think in March, or uh, probably pulled one in April, did okay. Lost to Jeremy Wilkes, who's one of those guys you don't really know about, but who's really good. Yeah, solid. <clears throat> and um, in May, I did the Contraband Tournament, right? So that's a, that's a pretty decent tournament. Mm-hmm. I think I got second or something um, right-handed, and yep. I beat Bryce. I beat Bryce Moe that day, who oh, okay. also who might have been a national champion at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was certainly, kind of certainly solid level, yeah. See, you know, whatever it was, he was at a solid level, probably at like one sixty-five, one seventy-six. So he shows up all you know dieseled out at one ninety-eight, and I just like I I, I just smashed him straight sideways. And um, mm-hmm. at the time, I was quick, like ready, go, bam, you know, mm-hmm. kind of high hand, straight sideways. Um, eventually, I got really slow. Um, but um, <laughs> I know how that goes, mate. I'm that guy as well, yeah. Yeah, and I, I tell people all the time, I always, I thought I was slow from the start. But when I look at the videos, I was actually fast. Then I learned what strong was and how that feels. And that's when I got real slow. I said, let me not uh, – Hurt myself hitting on these people. Um, and then that summer, so this is probably June or July, I did UAL 1. I'm right. trying to read that. Yeah, 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 this, yeah. This, yeah, first UAL, Venice Beach, John Brzezink versus Jerry Cataret. You know, Tom Nelson was there. Rob Vigent was there. Chris Chandler was there. I mean, it was a big event. Um, I won the amateurs right and left, maybe undefeated. And then I also did open that day. And I want to say I had a win in the open class. I could be wrong. I do remember pulling Eric Wolf, and I do remember Eric bitching so much in the setup, and he still does it today. Like 10 years later, you pull Eric, he's going to bitch in the setup. Uh, and I just couldn't understand why this why this pro guy who I've watched on Arm TV, who's got 20-plus inch arms, is giving me this much shit. You know, because I'm not even I'm really not that good. And, Neil, at the time, I think I was like 185, mm-hmm. like 190. I mean, like scrawny. Yeah. Scrawny. <laughs> but it's probably because I still could have beat him. That might have been why he was bitching so much. <laughs> I don't know. But um, so, that, yeah, that's year one. I pulled a lot of tournaments. I pulled 19 tournaments in my first 14 months. Mega. Mega. Um, Surprise, you I could. Guess, to be honest, I'm surprised you didn't have more joint pain with a, from a new guy. And particularly a strong new guy who's getting after it. That's a really, really uh, good innings, that is, mate. You've done well. Yeah, no, I, I had the pains. Own. I had the pains and um, couldn't sleep a lot of times. You know, mm-hmm. I'd pull with Ray on a Thursday, and then Saturday my brother would be around. He'd be like, oh, well, yeah. let me try. And that just makes it worse. You can't pull 
two days later when you're new or maybe even at all. Um, and so fast forward to 2012. Um, well, I don't know. I had some good wins in 2011. I think I beat Glenn Brooks at the Alabama State Championships. No, the solid puller. Yeah, I don't remember a whole lot. But so 2012 comes around. Um, I have stress fractures. At this point, Craig has come back. I probably oh. trained with Craig for about six to eight months, maybe. Well, that's why I have the stress fractures. <laughs> and, so, and so that was the progression. It will it was, be, mate. I'll tell you. Yeah, it was yeah. pulling with Ryan and Joey. Pulling with Ray and then acclimating, mm-hmm. and then Craig comes back. Yeah, and then I go, "Holy crap! This, yeah. this is what strong is." I mean, it was just the stupidest thing ever. So those are the levels. And so I'm at practice, and Craig, Craig needs to work on his hits, right? And Brandon Bodewin, Brandon Bodewin's <laughs> like, "No, nah, yeah, nah. you're not, you're not gonna hit on me." Um, I said, "Let's do it." So then my practice becomes Craig hitting me 50 times every practice. You know, so I went through the race cycle. <laughs> then it becomes Craig, and it's just wham, 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 over and over and over and over again, right? Um, again, um, teaching by showing, you know, again, that's that Robert Redden stuff, right? That's how I describe it because that's how it was kind of told to me. Like he would just – he would grind them. And they kind of grinded everybody else because that's what they knew. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point to where I couldn't curl 20 pounds. Right. Yeah, I mean, stress fractures throughout this. And I have a pretty long forearm in general. So I think that stress, mm-hmm. like, if my arm's going to flex a little bit more than like Todd's arm who's two inches shorter. Um, Jesus. So something happened. School got busy, engineering design projects. I stopped going to practice um, maybe for a couple months. And then, like, I went to a tournament. Jerry A. Vance was there. So this is exactly two years after I, Jerry A. Vance beat me, and I mm-hmm. thought that I would never move Jerry A. Vance's arm. And uh, we get there. Boom. Crush him. Right? Um, we didn't pull left-handed, and I think he might have been better left-handed. And Jerry's also someone you don't, like, you kind of can't joke with. Like, yeah, yeah. If he perceives the joke to be taken the wrong way, like it's he's going to fight. It's yeah. on, right? Um, so afterwards, I said, Jerry, let's pull left handed. And like he took it well. He was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and they went, boom, pin Jerry. And nothing happened. <laughs> there were no sparks, no nothing. Yeah. He shook each other's hand. And, uh, Jerry and I have been cool ever since. Like we can joke, we can poke at each other and all that stuff. So great moment. Um, I think, I think Jer- Jerry's probably one of those people like he respects strength. Yeah. 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 He knows right. if, he knows if one is real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if I was Joe Blow scrub and I was poking at him, I don't think I could get away mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. So beat Jerry. That was a huge day for me. Beat Jeremy Wilkes, who was there. Um, and then. Did the engineering design project, graduated from college, moved to California, and I didn't know anybody out there. I said, I went on Northeast board. Hey, I'm moving to Bakersfield, California. Um, who's there? What's going on? I said, I'm flying in on this date. Eric Martinez uh, messages me, and Eric's a longtime uh, arm wrestler, kind of runs the Bakersfield scene. He said, um, we're in Bakersfield, um, and there's a tournament. The day after you land, he said, you can meet us at this address. We'll, we'll, we'll ride there. So I said, great. I land. Um, I tell the driver to take me to a cheap hotel. I end up at the Twin Towers Motel. And I mean, just the grimiest place ever. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a completely different story, but, uh, get in the car with Eric and those guys. I go to Patterson. Tom Nelson's there. Lou Kent's there. Like the whole, it's the arm benders country. And yeah. uh, I'm, pulling, I'm pulling 198, and uh, I, I won the 198 right-handed class, and I beat Luke <clears throat> that day, right? Okay. And so, mm-hmm. again, Luke's 176, I'm 98, but I'm a two-year guy. <clears throat> yeah, so, so everybody's now, noticing. Yeah, everybody's like, who the hell is this guy? And then that kind of was what started, uh, I guess, my trajectory up. After that, it's like I was off to the races. Yeah. 
I actually heard about that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Time. I did. I heard about that. Some of the Cali boys. Who, at that time, obviously, I'm keeping my eye on the game for various reasons. Yeah. And I, that's the, in fact, that's the first time I heard your name. Yeah. And because I remember him mentioning it, and I'm like, no, no, I ain't come across that guy. And they're like, oh, he's for real. Yeah, he's for real. He smacked, he smacked Luke. And I'm like, really? Okay. Yeah, that is interesting because Luke had been doing pre- Luke was on that sort of UAL radar as well. He was like one of their star properties and you know, uh, and I had not come across you before. So yeah, I do recall that. I recall that when you mentioned it then. Interesting time. And, ladies and gents, we are 50 minutes in. And that means we've been running a little bit over, but we're getting carried away. It's easy to do so as I'm sure you've all enjoyed the show, ladies and gents, and we're not done with Herman. We're only warming up. But if this is your first visit to Supernatural Strength, please like, share, subscribe, let everybody know about it, and we will be back with Herman Stevens for more in the second part of this. Till that time, take it easy, peeps.